All right, we're gonna back up a little bit on waves. You remember that a wave on a, um, on a rope, if you've got a rope and it's got a wave coming in like this and it is tied down on this post, then the reflected wave will be, well, let's draw the reflected in blue. The reflected wave is gonna have to come out like this, right? And it'll be inverted. And uh, I guess the alternative is the purple wave comes in, woo! <laughs> the purple wave comes in and you can slide freely along this post here. And as a result, the reflected wave, it'll go whoop, whoop, and it'll come back down and the reflected wave is going to be going that direction and it will not be inverted. So we've got these two possibilities. You've got inversion and not inverting and it depends on the boundary condition. You can also, if you talk about ropes, you could have a thick rope and then it turns into a thin rope and it turns out that reflections in this case, well, let me get this straight, reflections in this case do not have a phase change. There's gonna be a reflection right here at this interface. And as the interface goes from heavy rope to light rope, there'll be a wave that continues in the light rope. But there will also be a wave that is reflected at this interface, and the fraction of the energy that's reflected and the fraction that's transmitted depends on some physics I don't want to go into right now. It's not that bad, but I don't want to go into it. But the reflections are not inverted if the wave is going that direction. But if I've got the same situation, but just kind of reversed, I'm going to have a wave going that direction, and it's about to hit a region where the rope is really, really, really thick. <clears throat> this reflection, sorry, will be inverted. So that's interesting, and we could set up a wave machine and see that. Um, it would be really interesting to see. I don't have one built yet, but we should definitely look at that. But uh, at this point, you're gonna have to just kind of accept this. So this corresponds more to that. It's like an open end, kind of. It kind of looks like it. A reflection wouldn't be inverted because it's kind of open and free over here. And this is kind of like a fixed end. It is kind of like a fixed end because you've got a free moving wave that hits this. It's like, dang, it's got a bunch of inertia. It's kind of like being stuck right there. So the reflection will be inverted here and the reflection will not be inverted in that kind of a case. So let's apply this to light. If I have a region of light I have a religion of, uh, of substance that light can get through. Let's say that it's seafoam green and um, there's a ray of light coming in here, mm, regular green light. If that ray of light comes in there and is then reflected back out, if this, now let's obey the law of reflection. You know what? Don't worry that entire thing. If I've got a sea from green thing and I'm gonna have a reflection coming in here, here's an incoming ray and there's an outgoing ray. If I've got <clears throat> N big here, here's a high index of refraction and here's a low N small, low index of refraction on this side, this is like an open end and so we will have no phase change. No phase change. No phase change on the reflection. But if I get you some seafoam green over here, and I say that I've got light coming in, now the, the interesting thing is the ratio of these indices of refraction doesn't immediately tell us anything about how much is reflected and how much is uh, refracted and would go through there. So. All I'm interested in right now is whether the reflected ray, who cares how big it is, but whether the reflected ray will have a phase change. Because of course, there's some light going through here. Let's see, if n big and then n small, I guess it'll bend away from the normal. And if I'm from n small and I'm going to n big, it's gonna bend towards the normal. That's cool. But I'm not interested in the blue line at this point. I'm only interested in that reflection. And you know that the incoming angle is always the same as the outgoing angle for the reflection. Okay, so in the case where we're going going from a small index of refraction and then bouncing off a big index of refraction, there is in fact a phase change. And that phase change is 180 degrees or half of a wavelength. That's what it means to get half of a wavelength out of phase. So I guess we have two ways that we can change the, uh, the phase of a wave. You could just to change phase, here are the rules. You could change phase. One, wait. B, 
because the wave is doing this thing, it's changing its phase continuously as a function of time. And number two, <coughs> duh. Number two is you could reflect off of a surface with a bigger index of refraction. Reflect from n small off n big. And that would change it by lambda over two. So that brings me to a very interesting device called an air wedge. I have two sheets of glass that are incredibly flat and like optically flat. These are very nice pieces of glass and I've tied a rubber band around one side so that they are attached here. So they're flat there and touching here and flat there. So they're parallel in this region right here. And if you look at this, do you think they're parallel all the way? I mean, they kind of look like it, but there is in fact a small gap over here because I've got a little bit of paper on that side. It's important that, that paper not be wrinkled at all because too many wrinkles is gonna throw this experiment off entirely. I've got just one single sheet of tissue paper through here and you can't do this with anything much larger. Forget about it, even with spaghetti. Even with spaghetti, it'd be a reasonable approximation that these guys are parallel, but they're so close to parallel. I'm gonna draw, ooh, though. I'm gonna draw it like this. I'm gonna emphasize their non-parallel nature. This is an air wedge because here's a plate of glass and here's another plate of glass and in between them is a wedge. Remember, they're, they're tied together with the rubber band right here. In between them is a wedge of air. Do you see it? Yeah, it's right in there. And this is a human hair or a piece of paper or summer sausage or something. No, it can't be that big, sorry. So the interesting thing is as light comes in here, can we use um, purple light? Sure. As light comes in here, it's gonna be going in and well, this is a small index of refraction here, n small, and this is n big. We should put ones and twos to these suckers. We got n small in the middle too, and n big up in here, and n small, or maybe there's like a desk underneath it, and that would be fine. We could just eliminate anything behind it. So I wanna study two rays in particular. One of them is coming in here and bouncing off this interface between big and small, and it's coming back out here and then bending away from the normal. And this guy I'm going to name ray one. Ray one comes out like that. Ray two though is coming from the same place and it bends, let's see, it's gonna bend away from normal right here. So it'll be going like, let's see, like that. And then it will reflect off of here. Oh, this is what ray two is doing. So ray two is gonna reflect off of here and then bend back towards the normal there and then back away from the normal there and it will go out parallel. Here's ray two and there's ray one. There are lots of other reflections here. Just to hint at a couple, let me show you that there's a reflection right here. We're not gonna consider that. There's also a transmission right here, and we're not gonna consider that. And then a reflection right here, and a reflection here, two, 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 two. This one would also reflect here, two, 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 two. This one would reflect here, two, 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 two. So there are a lot of things that we could consider. But I pretend that only two things are happening so that I can understand at least how a really, really interesting pattern is formed. And I hope that I'll be able to show you that pattern as we, before we conclude. Here's the thing. What I wanna talk about is the effective path difference between ray one and ray two. And I'm going to define this distance here to be D. That's the distance between the two plates. Notice that ray two is going twice as far, to, sorry, it's going significantly farther than ray one, but that distance is really just 2D. In the sense that we can assume these plates to be parallel, look, they're really close to parallel. In the sense that we can assume them to be parallel, we can say that the actual path length difference is two times D. But watch this. At the point where this reflects, I've got reflecting off of, from a small index refraction to a large index of refraction. So let's check that. It says small index of refraction ray comes in, reflects back off of a big index of refraction. We're gonna get ourselves a phase change of lambda over two. So if I say not just the actual path length difference between ray one and ray two, I'm gonna say that, uh, well, this, this is just the length effective of two minus the length effective of one. But the cool thing is, as soon as I write that word effective right there, it's gonna be 2D because it's actually been changing phase during that distance, because that's how you change phase, you could wait. Duh. 
or you can get a reflection off of a higher index of refraction. So it goes from small to large. It's reflecting off of large. And I don't mean in refraction. There is no phase change in this refraction or that refraction or that refraction or that refraction. Only upon reflection is there a phase change. And that phase change is half of a wavelength. Now let's back up. This is the effective path length difference between ray one and ray two, and whether ray one and ray two, which are both going into your eyes, whether, whether, whether ray one and ray two will be constructive, they will be constructive if delta L effective is some integer number of wavelengths. M is one or two or three or four or something. Maybe some whole number of wavelengths. Uh, oh, oh, ray one and two will be destructively interfering if the difference in path length, the effective difference in path length is a half integer of wavelength. So I could say, oh, what do I want to say here? M times lambda plus one half of lambda. Okay, so here's my conclusion. Then this, I gotta compare this to that, and I gotta compare this to that. Let's get ourselves a couple equations. But first I wanna say that look, ray one and ray two are both going to your eye. They come out parallel and they're going to your eye. So if they interfere constructively, then I have a bright fringe. Means I see light. And if they interfere destructively, then I have a dark fringe, which means I see nothing. So. Notice that D is changing, and as D is getting bigger, I'm gonna be going from bright fringe to dark fringe to bright fringe to dark fringe. Maybe that's not obvious. Let me make the equation first. Here's what I wanna do. I wanna take this equation right here, the effective path length, and I wanna set it equal to that for a bright fringe. I'm gonna say bright fringe means that 2D plus lambda over two equals M times lambda. And I'm gonna divide this by lambda to get us a cool equation. It says 2D over lambda plus one half is an integer. If that's true, then we have a bright fringe. And we'll do dark fringe up here. Dark fringe. We have, oh shoot, we have, oh gosh, this is gonna be really nice. We've got uh, oh, er, 2D plus a half, sorry, 2D plus lambda over two, that's this right here, is equal to that stuff right there. Check it out. This is M times lambda plus one half times lambda. Wait a second, that will just cancel from both sides. <gasps> Lovely. So if, I'm gonna solve this in the same way. I'm gonna say 2D over lambda. If it's an integer, then we have a dark fringe. Oh, this is very different because of that half wavelength shift. It's kind of like the opposite of what we just studied. So don't get yourself confused. This is a special case where I've got a reflection off of a higher index of refraction. So this gives us a dark fringe if we've got an integer that is twice this distance divided by the wavelength. Oh, that's just gonna be the phase difference. Of course, and then that's a dark fringe, and then if, uh, if I have a bright fringe, I need to have, oh, I need to have an additional half wavelength change in order to get these guys back into phase. So let's see if this actually works. I should get a series of bright fringe, dark fringe, bright fringe, dark fringe, bright fringe, dark fringe, as I move across this direction. And they ought to be like that, like lines. Let's see if you can see this on the camera. Let me go very slowly, move the light. I see it better when the light is on it. Start over here. Can you see those red and green lines? They are extremely closely spaced. In fact, I've got, when I look at it right here, I've got red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, something like that. If I take out this, then the lines are much, much broader in spacing, and there ought to be no lines at all. So if I wanted to measure, 
Wait a second, if I wanted to measure the thickness of this piece of paper, I could use this. This is an extremely accurate measuring tool because it's using the wavelengths of light itself. Wait a second, I'd want to be really careful because this has to do with wavelength and I can't just shine a white light on it. I'd want to shine a light that has either a bunch of red or a bunch of green or maybe this won't work under sunlight. Maybe it only works under fluorescent lights. Also, as I squeeze it, I see the pattern of light bars changing. Those fringes are changing orientation as these become closer and further away to parallel. So this is a really neat way to measure the thickness of something in terms of wavelengths of light itself. Cool, see you later.